evening, everyone, and welcome to Freedom School 4.0. This is our fourth semester of it. It is hosted by the Department of Africana Studies at Georgia State University and co-hosted by our partners, Auburn Avenue Research Library. Um, wanted to say first, thank you to Jonathan Gales and especially Dr. Lakita Bennett Bailey, who has been running this Freedom School for the past four semesters and to one of our favorite collaborators, Morris Gardner over at Auburn Avenue Research Library. So tonight we have Afrofuturism, Black Imagining and Historical Records and Television, which is a conversation with Dr. Jonathan Kidd. And I am very excited for this evening. Um, I'm going to start with a brief introduction, and then he and I will have a bit of a conversation, and then we'll save a little bit of room at the end for um, Q&A, okay? So, Dr. Kidd earned his BA in African American Studies and English at the University of Michigan with honors. He then went on to earn his MA, MPhil, and PhD at Yale University in African American Studies and English. His dissertation within the bosom of the bard, Shakespeare and social death, um, argues that Shakespeare invents the human and the inhuman, and that looking at Shakespeare through the lens of social death allows one to look at literature more broadly through racialized, gendered, and sexualized and marginalized lenses. He explores the marginalized characters of Shakespeare's plays and puts Shakespeare in conversation with folks like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, reading that novel as a transgressive and transgendered slave narrative. And in my favorite chapter, he uses Jewel Gomez's The Gilda Stories to think through the racialization of the AIDS crisis and recouping stigmatized communities from prominent stereotypes, putting their marginalization in conversation with Shakespeare's Macbeth and The Merchant of Venice. His work then crossed between the fictional and the lived world and addressed centuries old tales and current social events at the same time. At Yale, he also met his writing partner, Sonia Winton Adanton. They started Adam, Eve, and Steve Theater Productions and put on a number of wonderful plays. They then went on to do um, a documentary, Battleground for a New Generation, which was about youth voting in the early 2000s. And through that, they covered a lot of different movements like Rock the Vote, National Political Hip Hop Convention, Punk Voter, and a number of other voting projects. Their work moved from documentary film into theater and they were part of Susan Laurie Park's 365 Days, 365 Plays, and before transitioning into television as part of Warner Brothers Television Writing Workshop in 2009. Their TV credits as writers and as producers include The Whole Truth, Touch, NCIS New Orleans, Wicked City, and Lovecraft Country, which they co-executive produced and were Emmy nominated in the category of Outstanding Drama Series in 2021. Together, they've put together a massive deal with HBO, including some new projects that hopefully we'll hear about. <laughs> and they've also been activists teaching youth theater in Los Angeles, and more recently with their Feed Black COVID-19 project, which um, the Health Workers Challenge, which reached Black health workers in underserved areas in cities across the nation. In the midst of all this, Dr. Kidd has taught at illustrious universities such as Columbia University and after graduating also at Yale University, which is where I met him as a very young teenager. Um, he mentored me and many of my friends. After he graduated, he came back and taught and I took his class. And for me, that was the first time I understood what it meant to earn a PhD, to see him in that space, right? I had the opportunity to work on him, to work with him on the documentary. And it was my introduction to making film and making film on the ground with grassroots organizers. We were also involved in some other activism that I won't specifically name on campus. And since then, he has been a critical step, a critical part of every step of my career, right? He helped me with my applications to graduate school, wrote letters of rec. He was there at my graduation. He, we did what uh, mock QE exams, you gave me feedback on my dissertation, and I'm not entirely certain that I have ever quite said thank you for that. So one, thank you for your work in general, and also thank you for your love, right? So we're going to jump straight into things. Um, and I wanted to start, the first question is, how did you begin as a writer? And then 
what led you specifically to television? Uh, I would say that thanks for the great introduction. I hate introductions. I hate talking about myself. So it's always cringy. Like, oh, I had all this accomplishment. I'm here to yeah. Uh, whereas for me, I just wake up and I just live my life. You know, so Leah and I, uh, Dr. Bascom and I, very similar in that regard. Um, I feel like, how do I start writing? I've always been a writer. Yeah, you know, I think I was a writer as a kid and uh, I played, you know, would create stories to my older sister. Um, we had like a, uh, we were spoiled children. And so we had a bunch of different toys, uh, mm -hmm. Star Wars toys, Sesame Street toys, Fisher Price toys, whatever. And we put them all together in a town called People Land, Florida. And whenever we had time, we were done for homework or on weekends, we'd always play stories that they would do you know, and they would get married and, you know, um, some would get rich, they won the lottery, the giraffe family won the lottery. Actually they didn't, it was like a mutual aid lottery. So they were poor <laughs> and then the church came together and gave them money, so they became rich. So they became like a benefactor for the town and then some toys got broken. So you had funerals and all that stuff. And uh, then my little sister came along. Um, similar thing, but it was more about like engaging her uh imagination engaging her understanding of the world this you know like i wrote a book for her called this is the world andrea lynn when she was i think she was probably eight or nine months old maybe um so it's always been a part of my life and i think because of that i never took it seriously and so uh, my family supports the arts most definitely um, i would say that my parents and my grandparents were also very much uh, about certain things meant success. So my older sister is an attorney by study. You know, I was on the road to be a cardiologist. Mm. Uh, so when I decided not to be a cardiologist, <laughs> that was a conversation, it was multiple conversations. Why are you not gonna be a cardiologist? You know, like playing the piano, playing jazz trumpet, that's good for like, you know, cocktail parties when you're a doctor and your doctor friends are hanging out and you're like, oh, I can play the piano too, right? Or talking about <laughs> literature. Also too, for me, um, English was always easy. It kind of, it's just, it was like breathing air. Writing is like breathing air. And so because of that, I had a, for whatever reason, warped sense of education. And I thought that you had to major in something that really challenged you, that kind of scared you, that made you be like, what? You know, so I was looking forward to taking Orgo. I was looking forward to taking, what was it, Fortran back in the days, back in the 90s. Um, all those sort of like challenging science left brain things. And then it got to a point where it was like, I love literature, you know, and I, I love, there's, there's a science to writing. There's a science to reading. There's a science to crafting story and world building and all those wonderful things. And so it was an interesting marriage, you know, in that regard. And that's what led me to being a, a FM and English major. And then I would say in terms of television, it was kind of happenstance. You know, I think that uh, my writing partner and I have, we're both like entre entrepreneurially spirited people. And so, you know, like the documentary that, you know, Dr. Baskin mentioned, you know, she was with me at the National Health Political Convention in Newark. And it was like five of us in a hotel room. I'm sleeping on the floor. We're eating bologna sandwiches out of the cooler that we packed and we're doing the thing. It's like, okay, we're just gonna get this shot. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm buy us lunch though. Yes, I did buy lunch, yes. <laughs> you know, we're gonna fight for the shots, we're gonna do the thing. So we don't have to take no for an answer. And so mm -hmm. I think in that regard, uh, we got into that initially because we saw a gap in programming. You know, we have visions for BET that they're kind of doing now with like scripted shows and reality TV shows for BT with black people because there's, we watch so much television, you know, like all soap operas are alive basically because of black people, you know, mm -hmm. um, if you look at Young and the Restless, when they took off Neil and Drew and them, the ratings went down and they put them back and they went back up to number one, you know, <laughs> but um, so I would say that, you know, the TV writing came about because we did the documentary, we moved to LA to produce that and get money, finishing funds, um, didn't get the money because Kerry lost the election and we were told that the youth didn't matter and they didn't vote, which wasn't true. It was just that, you know, evangelicals uh, were rallied around the sodomy issue, sodomy issue. Um, and all the superdomas are being passed in 2004 and they came out in greater numbers. And so when we were here, uh, actually the former president rocked the vote, pitched us a TV show idea about her. And we were like, 
we don't like the world, but we like you as a character because you're very complex and you've lived a life. And so we'll put you in uh, as a reporter working for Fox News mm -hmm. after 9-11 when you've had this shift in your paradigm where now you're a basically a raging progressive. And so that was the first TV spec pilot I wrote. And then that was in 2007. And so from 2007, 2009, we had meetings, you know, we uh, did everything we could to get in front of people, you know, like I sent chocolates to different producers around town because um, there's a writer, she, she rests in power, her name is Linda Yearwood. Uh, she was on One Life to Live and also The Fresh Prince. Mm -hmm. But her uh, way in, when I met her, she said, I just wrote letters to the writers at One Life to Live and I lived in New York. And so they were like, hey, send us a script. So just send people letters, you know, but she did this in the, you know, in the 80s, I believe. So I did that for a while. And then, uh, like I said, we just took meetings and we didn't take no for an answer, I'm kind of being vague. But for example, like we looked at the list of people that we talked to with the documentary because Rock the Vote had a lot of different events. So we're like, OK, we're going to go talk to this person because we met at this event, you know, and there's one particular executive. His name is Tim McNeil, who was at ABC at the time. And uh, he was over the diversity program. And we're like, yeah, we met him you know, at this event. Da, da, da. So we get in, we sit on the couch with him. And he was like, yeah, I told my assistant that you know, I never met you guys. But if you ended up on my couch, I guess we're supposed to be talking. I, I respect the hustle. <laughs> you know? And we're like, OK, well, now we're here. Let's just pitch ourselves. You know? <laughs> so that went on for two years. And then uh, we were adamant about not applying to diversity programs because of the stigma that mm -hmm. uh, this whole white supremacist structure, you know, gaslights you into believing where it's like, oh, this system is smacking you in the mouth. And then it's like, okay, well, give me a Kleenex. Why do you have a Kleenex? Those are gross. It's very psychotic, right? Mm -hmm. But we applied to a couple of them and most applied to the Warner Brothers Workshop, which is a non-diverse program. Um, when I say non-diverse, it's like the people of the global majority are in the mix like everybody else, right? Uh, we got in that program in 2009 and got staffed in 2010. We've been staffed ever since. So that's sort of like how I got into it. Oh, so in terms of thinking about that first, uh, you know, writing spec that you, the TV spec that you pitched, thinking about 9-11, thinking about some of your most, um, I guess, the topics that you work on, right? Mm -hmm. Your work can be funny. Your work is always makes you think, but you you often deal with some of the hardest parts of history and the most heart wrenching and the most anger inducing parts of history. So, what draws you to those stories? One, and then how do you balance the pain of them with the world of entertainment? All right, good question. Uh, so, I would say that I've always been attracted to um, the marginal. You know, if you think about uh, uh, makes you rest in peace, Bill Hooks, but just the, the phrase from, from margin to center, you know, like when they came out reading her books, I'm just like devouring, like, oh my gosh, like uh, yearning is like, ah, you, know, you just, it's like your brain is like burning, like you're lifting weights with your brain. Uh, so for me, it was like a worldview that academia, black, black studies, and I will get to this question later, but Africana studies gave me a lens for a worldview that I kind of already had. You know, so my dad's a retired steel worker. My mom's a retired school teacher. So I grew up very pro-union. I grew up around uh, people, you know, my, how do I say this? So like, you know, I feel like with Trump's America in some aspects, I feel like growing up in, in Ohio where I grew up at the time I grew up, there's aspects of that where it's like, oh, the United States is just catching up to my lived experience. I was living this in the eighties. Damn it, Trump was like, you know, my biology teacher, right? Um, but I would say that, you know, in terms of writing about those people, to me, those are the most interesting stories. Mm -hmm. You know, we did FaceTime, which was a 9 11 story. And then after that, we did uh, AWOL Hearts, A W O L Hearts, which is about four vets coming back from Afghanistan with a wartime secret. Um, you know, we were told it was too dark. It was too bleak because we're talking about PTSD and meth addiction and, you know, men becoming sex workers to feed their families and they don't have limbs and, you know, all this stuff. 
And then they're like, it's too dark, change it. And so then that turned into a Once in Future Hope, which is basically the same show, but the, the main character uh, was his, the son of a governor, kind of based on one of my good friends from high school, um, went to West Point, and then he's coming back with the secret, but also he has this aspirational JFK trajectory, which they kind of did on Brothers and Sisters with Rob Lowe's character, who's kind of mm -hmm. like that. Um, but again, this, the system was like, no, don't do it. You know, and this is before Army Wives and Over There and all the other war shows that we've seen since. But I think that uh, we have a sex trafficking pilot um, that didn't go, you know, we had it set up with Robert De Niro's company and uh, people thought the, store, the, the world was too bleak, you know, and it was too visceral. But for us, you know, everyone has a story to tell, but I think it's the most marginal, it's the most uh, out there stories that you can learn from, you know, our neo-Nazi pilot called the Fourth Reich, which we sold and set up to sh wait, at Showtime. And it was neck and neck with um, Ray Donovan. So mm -hmm. if Ray Donovan wouldn't have aired, we would be, you know, we would have had our ACs in the run. But the thing I love about the Fourth Reich is that it's about neo-Nazis in Boston and Southie specifically, because we didn't want to be in the South. We don't want to be a stereotype of a Confederate flag on a pickup truck and somebody's like, can you? Got some dip, I'm gonna fuck my cousin. That's kind of boring. And also it's very dismissive of the power of white supremacy. It's like January 6th, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, these hillbillies are coming, taking over the Capitol and just blah, 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 blah. Okay, first of all, a lot of people that were not quote unquote hillbillies, they were flying on private jets to the January 6th uh, insurrection, but also what's behind that, right? Same people behind the Tea Party, the same, the same powers that be that want to divide and conquer and be like, okay, nobody has health care, but you, gumless white person, you're a little bit better than that toothless black person back over there. Really better than them immigrants over there because they got a mouth full of teeth. And you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's uh, again, uh, a deranging process, you know? Mm -hmm. But with the fourth, what I loved about the pivotal scene in that first episode was the men talking about how they joined together. They all were in a, in a foster care home. They're mm -hmm. getting beat up. By kids from the global majority so black kids and Latin latinx kids was effing them up right and they were like we're going to form a pack and, and be a brotherhood just like crips just like latin kings just like bloods just like folks peoples everybody else right and if you look at it from that perspective you know saying it's just about families just about belonging because who doesn't want to feel safe who doesn't want to feel loved who doesn't want to feel like they belong right and it's and so in writing about neo-nazis in series we would have been able to speak to you know, people keep talking about, you know, oh, more black people die from black on black crime. Blah, blah. There's a lot of organizations that speak to that violence, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? We're just saying the people that are supposed to be protecting and serving us with our tax dollars that they spend in other communities because they don't live in our communities, right? Those people should not be killing us haphazardly mm -hmm. for no reason, just because they feel like it, because it's a taser or because it's a windshield wiper or because it's some grass or it's because a piece of chewing gum. You think my inhaler is an M16. Like whatever the psychotic, I keep saying psychotic, I'm trying not to say that. Deranged is a, a better word. To me, mm -hmm. white supremacy is a, is a, um, is a uh, intentional systemic sort of deranged, deranged inducing um, system. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to kind of be accepting that, you know, kind of like the matrix in order to participate. But anyway, back to your question. I think that with the pain of it all, to me, it's just the pain is part of the process of illumination, you know? first I would say that and then I think that it's about it's less painful writing about it than it is holding it inside mm -hmm. you know I think that being able to sit down and you know that that sex traffic and pilot was really difficult for me you know um excuse me all the things that we read and then you it's like again it's like taking the pill you're unplugging and you're like Okay, so we used to work in a coffee shop and, and sort of like a little kind of like hippie area, you know, it's LA. And then you read like, oh, predominant people that buy children are over 40 professional white men. That's everybody in this coffee shop. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm freaked out. Do you know what I mean? Like there were those moments where you see kids selling chocolates on the street corner or in front of a grocery store, you know. I still do it now, but it's like, hey, are you okay? Are you safe? Do mm -hmm. you need help? Do you need me to call the police? Because in my mind, I'm like, these kids, they're selling chocolate, particularly if they're black kids, black kids selling chocolate. Is this a sex trafficking gig, right? Mm -hmm. So I think being able to write about those things to me is cathartic. 
you know, mm-hmm. and I think in terms of the pain, I think that is just something, uh, you know, the grief and the, and the rage is, is the cloak, mm-hmm. you know, I think I wake up angry. I'd be angry if I wasn't a writer, you know, because I'm aware of what's going on around me. So I'm pissed as, as you know, I'm trying not to curse because it's, you know, this environment, it but is, it is in the I, life. I, I, I'm pissed as serious bad word. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> about the way of the world you know what I mean like because it's always something you know like mm-hmm. last week it was seeing the images of people from the diaspora being pulled off of trains and being blocked from leaving the Ukraine because again it's like oh no we're white and Christian you can't get on the train to safety but yet mm-hmm. have empathy for me because the Russians are trying to kill us and it's like the the disconnect is such a fascinating thing you know, but again, to your point, I think that um, I also do like my life coaching practice, mm-hmm. you know, which I was an activist practice, which I got from a Quaker mentor of mine. And I was like, how did you survive 1968? Because they killed Martin, they killed Bobby, they had a Ted offensive, they elected Nixon, they started war on drugs, like what, why did you just leave or just, you know, react in a different way? <laughs> And he was like four S's, sexuality, spirituality, sports, and small victories. Mm-hmm. Um, sexuality being sexuality, sexual expression, whether it's with a person by yourself. Spirituality is yoga, uh, going to church, meditation, prayer, sports, physically active, and the most important one, small victories. And that is, you know, donating to a homeless person when you're by yourself and no one's paying attention. Or you go to your job. And you, you had created a boundary and you didn't get fired. You feel good about yourself, you know, like mentoring, you know, like those, to me, that's the thing that uh, kind of keeps me balanced, you know, but the creative aspect of it doesn't, um, all it does is precipitate the emotion, you know, mm-hmm. like when we talk about the project I'm working on now, I was sobbing most of Friday, this past Friday, you know, I was sobbing yesterday. You know, yesterday it was a horrible day. And I said to my brother, so school, have drinks last night. I was like, I'm not going out. I'm not leaving the house. Because I know if I leave the house, that grief will turn into, you know, rage. If someone gives them salt when they ask for it, and I got to wait five minutes for my salt, I'm like, well, why is my salt different than their salt? Do you know what I mean? Because I'm already in, I'm already in a space of like, uh, you know. So really, it's, it's more about managing that energy, you know, when it comes up. And then my manager calls us, uh, method writers because we get so into the characters we get so into the worlds and the emotions but for me I feel like the emotion if you don't have an emotion then it's like what are you doing it for yeah you know cool so in thinking about your process right and and for the students in the black iconography course on the call uh, we've done a lot of the encoding and decoding you know with Hall and whatnot so what is it that you're hoping as a producer that your audience takes away from your work? Do you have any specific goals for them or is it more about what you want to get out? Uh, I think it changes over time. Mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, I've been doing this for 12 years. So when I started television, there was a kid in kindergarten, they just graduated high school, unfortunately, in the middle of a pandemic. Or fortunately, because they might go change the world, right? Can't say that, it's awesome. Awesome. (laughs) Go zoom out, guys. when I first, when we first started, when I first started in television, it, it was because it's part of the story. It's always a multitude of stories. I went to Ghana in um, 2005 and a uh, research trip. I was studying slave castles and while I was there, my writing partner flew over because she had met her husband earlier that year. She flew over and they got married while I was there and it was a whole thing. But one of the things that I did, I took clothes, I took cologne, deodorant and a bunch of books. And I gave it all away, right? And I gave money away when I was leaving town, right? To the point where I was just like, ah, out the cab. And people were like, well, you want to, is this a quid pro quo? You can't touch my daughter. And I'm like, no, bro, it's like, just take the money, bro, right? It was devastating for me because I didn't have the financial resources to make the impact that I wanted to make, right? So part of my turn to television, because at that point in my trajectory, I was a devout anarchist, right? I did love television, so I'm not saying I didn't watch television. It's a capitalist system. I didn't watch, you know, I wasn't that guy who didn't watch Spider-Man because he's turning black and turning into Venom and, you know, all that Toby McGuire. <laughs> I was like, it's Spider-Man, I'm going to watch it. But um, 
that was pivotal to me because I was like, I need money to help affect the change that I want to see in the world, you know? And then the, the gag is how do you do that and still maintain your principles, you know, once you're in the system and you're being co-opted and all this other stuff. So um, when I started my career, we weren't writing about black people. You know, we were by Amy Walker, who was on Oz, who's on um, Chicago Fire now, but he just happened to be a black actor on the show that we were on. We had Latinx actor, you know, who was playing a gay character. So I got a chance to write a gay character on my first show, which was amazing as a gay man. Um, but, you know, a lot of the stuff that we tried to do, you know, was shot down. You know, for example, we were on, uh, we were on NCS New Orleans, you know, uh, 2014, season one. So if you watch season one, NCS New Orleans, you see Sebastian. Sebastian is a white version of me, based on me. Conspiracy theory, you know, Jedi guy, <laughs> ah, right? More Sith than Jedi sometimes. Um, but there was a pitch that we signed now we're obsessed with for the season one finale, which was, okay, so we're going to introduce some people, you know, it's like 22 episodes, so we're right, episode 11, we're just going to see some people, you know, in the background, we see them talking and stuff, hey, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so, oh, he's the coffee shop owner, okay, what, blah, 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 right? And then uh, we get to episode 21, and episode 21, stuff's going on, whatever, chaos stuff, oh my goodness, there's a plot, oh, they're going to blow up the, the, the you know, the levees again, ah! Ah, who could it be? It's a white supremacist. Ah, right. Red herring. And they see homeboy, and then he starts speaking Arabic. I'm like, oh shit, what the fuck is going on? Oh my gosh, right? Boko Haram storyline, right? Mm -hmm. Whoa, bring back our girls. Oh, like all this stuff, right? We were like, that's bomb because New Orleans is a hub of it's a it's a global city, right? A cosmopolitan space of synchronization and all that, thing, right? All it could bring all that in Haiti and everything. Right. And also the motivation for why they're doing it. Right. And uh, we pitched it strong, pitched it strong again, pitched it strong again. And the feedback from the people that were in power, who happened to be not the global majority, uh, where that wasn't believable. Right. Mm -hmm. Same with like Nigerian oil magnets. There are no old Nigerian billionaires. Oops, yeah, printing out the Google sheet with the, the Nigerian billionaires, but average person in America. They're, they're not going to care about that. They just want to watch some blah, 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 right? So then we pitched the Hatfields and McCoys episode. They didn't want to do that because it was too country. Do you know what I mean? So it was, a, you know, so we, we did we did end up doing as our first episode of Mississippi Burning Homage mm -hmm. on the 40th anniversary where a Jewish uh, sailor was murdered for registering Black voters, which was amazing. We did a Gay Dads episode, which, uh, you know, was nominated for a GLAAD award. That was amazing. Um, but those both came with fights which I don't have to go into the details, but some really, you know, crazy, offensive, wild, pre-Me Too stuff was said about both of those episodes, you know, um, but it was a struggle, but because we didn't have the ability to say, hey, this is going to be a thing, we couldn't do it, you know, so I think a lot of the, a lot of this trajectory is influenced by that, you know, like Wicked City uh, is about the Sunset Strip killer, we try to bring in some of the people that were murdered and some people I'm working on now. It didn't fly. <laughs> Did it, I mean? Um, fast forward to Treadstone. You know, we're on 2017, season one. And I was just happy to be on a show where people are kicking each other in the face, mm -hmm. you know, and just doing the thing because uh, I was tired. And we had just done the sex trafficking pilot. And I was like, I just want to do something like he get the pool stick and break it in half and like poke him in the eye and stab him in the stomach and flip and you know, all that stuff. So to me, I've never had a end goal in terms of what the audience wants because I can't control that. You know, the end of the uh, Mississippi burning episode, season well, episode nine, season one, NCS New Orleans, um, Wade, um, the CCH Pounders character does say, uh, she does a toast. You know, she says some version of, I know one thing. I know we, we've come a long way, a long way to go, but I know one thing, love done right can, can change the world, right? I firmly believe that. That came mm -hmm. from my heart. And the 22 million people saw that. I was like, this is amazing. And it was right in the middle of Ferguson uprising about Michael Brown. Um, and I was like, that was amazing, you know? But in terms of someone watching that and going out and changing the way they move through the world, maybe, to me, all I can hope for as, as a, dare I say, entertainer 
is to be a conversation starter. You mm -hmm. know, I can't really control for, because everyone's bringing their own lens to the table. Everyone's bringing their own, you know, philosophical understanding of the world and of gender and race and formations of sexuality and, you know, um, all those different things. And so I don't really have a goal. I'm just happy to be able to speak my truth. And if other people uh, want to be inspired to fill in gaps and spaces, then I'm like, yes, you should go right. You know, that's one of the things that I took from uh, Kehinde Wiley, you know, who's a, a buddy of mine. But when he was, when he was, you know, just starting out back in like 2000, I was teaching at Columbia, it was 2006. No, 2005. And um, he uh, came to class, and, you know, it was a great class. And then someone asked an epic question. They were like, well, you know, as a black woman, where am I in this discourse of all these black men? And Kehinde was like, you should pick up a paintbrush. Mm -hmm. And it was like, ooh, everybody's like, what? Oh my goodness, how could you say that? What are you talking about? What? Right. Um, and I just said that. So I'm like, you know, whatever, free speech space. Um, but he had a point, which was, you know, I'm thankful that we did do Boko Haram because the Boko Haram version on a CBS cop show would not have been the nuanced version of, do you know what I mean? Nigerian Islam that you would want to see. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Well, can we cut the, he's have to have a daughter, cut that out. You know what I mean? No, no John Q backstory. Just, he doesn't need John Q. He may be inspired by the healthcare system in the United States. Just make him an angry terrorist. You know, like it would have been a really frustrating experience, I think, in retrospect, you know? And so to me, again, I don't, I just put it out there, you know, but in terms of like having a, a goal, Lovecraft Country, if Treadstone, I'll be honest about this, Treadstone, the Born Identity show, didn't start production when it was supposed to. If it had started production, I would have been in Europe, in Prague, shooting Treadstone and going to Tunisia, Morocco, <laughs> uh, Algeria, Botswana, Senegal, Togo, back to Ghana, and Nigeria. You know I mean? So it would have been a whole different life. And I've been like, okay, when's Netflix coming to the continent? Because I'm trying to be over here and just chill and get caked up, do a Nigerian cop show. Why not? <laughs> right? Um, because we need programming. So it wasn't like I set out to, I'm going to do Lovecraft Country. You know, it happened because that's the way the universe planned it. And once we got in, we were able to say, okay, so we're going to do Tulsa. We're going to do Emmett Till. We're going to do Marion J. Sims. Do you know what I mean? We're going to do Bleaching Cream. Like we were able to, to look at the book and be like, okay, this book is, it's good, you know, but cer in certain historical contexts, it's a bit anemic, mm -hmm. you know? And so we were able to infuse it with some of that blood that's beating in our hearts, you know, as the diaspora to have that experience, you know? But if I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have been able to predict that 12 years ago. You know, if you asked me 12 years ago, what else was I doing? I'm like, I'm working on a cop show and I'm living well, and I'm, I'm you know what I mean? I'm, oh, this is a social work episode. Great, great. <laughs> what are they gonna talk about? Being a social worker, they live. I'm like, oh, okay. Like again, the gay dads, they got their daughter back. That was a victory for me because in Louisiana at the, at the time, uh, adoption by gay parents was illegal. It might be illegal again at this point, but you know, at that time it was like, well, that's our intervention, you know, so. Oh. So both as a scholar and especially as a creative producer, you have this really groundedness in accurate histories, but you also lean heavily towards the science fiction, towards the speculative fiction, and especially, um, specifically Afrofuturism. So what do you think is so valuable about those genres? Um, well, I think that thought is invaluable. You know, mm -hmm. thoughts are things. And it's so amazing to think your way into a different existence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I read, you know, when you, to me, everything kind of points toward that space. We call it Afrofuturism because that's the cloak that we're wearing, you know. But if you listen to Funkadelic, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, uh, free your mind and your ass will follow, right? And then they say, what? The kingdom of heaven is within. That's what the Christ said, right? And so, it to me all leads to the same place. If you read Anne Rand, right? Some people hate her, a lot of progressives. Oh, read Anne Rand. But if you read her, <laughs> um, objectivism, whatever it is, 
it's a very specific way of understanding the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that can be liberating as a black person. Like, okay, I don't care about this. I'm not a part that a part of that system. Do you know what I mean? Don't put me in that. Like, that's not me because you can't see me as a human. You see me as a black person, but you can't. You can't talk about race because race for you has all these connotations to it, right? So that's why you're colorblind. So how about we just take it off the table, right? Like now functioning in a society that's built on white supremacy and genocide, it could be difficult to live that way. But to me, it's a way out, right? So if Afrofuturism and speculative fiction, the joy I find in it, one, I'm a fan of speculative fiction because I'm a fan of fantasy, aliens, monsters, all those things but then also we start digging into it vampires you're like the theme of the other what is what work does the other do you know like i'm obsessed with the biological functioning of like you know no one and for all you future scholars like gloria with her hand up uh who are out there writing future dissertations and teaching and you know like if someone's in the sciences you know we talk about social media right and the netflix you know like oh my gosh social media is a drug there's a dopamine release every time you hit a like button right we don't talk about the adrenal release that happens when people are scared, right? You go to a haunted house, brah, ah! right? Case in point, I'm in Santa Monica, right? Yes, looking for a house, right? In LA, right? All those wonderful things. I'm coming from the grocery store. I'm walking behind a woman, right? About half a block behind her. She happens to be a person who's not a global majority. And uh, she has her groceries too. And it's like six o'clock, it's just this far past sunset. And I'm like, oh gosh, I hope she's not going into my building. <laughs> <laughs> if she's going into my building, then it's gonna be potentially awkward. And I don't feel like dealing with this because I'm already in a I'm already in a, a writing space of looking at disparate treatment on a systemic level where it's like black women are being, you know, serious bad word every single time. You look around, right? Mm -hmm. So I keep walking. Oh, wow, she's going into my building where my Airbnb is, right? But she's a far enough ahead of me. Oh, she can't find her key. <laughs> so by the time she's still digging in her bag, looking for her key, I have my key out. So when she looks up, she looks at me and does one of these as I'm putting the key into the door, right? Open the door, um, for good or for bad. I've never been a person to hold doors. I just, I'm just, it's not in my constitution. Do you know what I mean? As, as a, as a five-year-old black kid, I didn't hold doors for nobody. Cause I was like, that's not me. Um, so she wasn't gonna get the door held anyway, but she really won't go get help because she jumped, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my goodness, oh, oh, right? Even though she saw me with the key. She saw me with the key cause I'm moving methodically. I'm turning it, I'm opening the door, I'm walking inside. So how am I gonna attack her if I got the freaking key and I'm carrying two bags of groceries from Whole Foods where you just came from, right? My only point of that story is that there was an adrenaline rush that surged through her body connected to her fear of me, right? So in that sense, you could say the white supremacy is in fact a drug because you're addicted to that. Shit. You're addicted to like, oh my, they're gonna steal our food. They're gonna rape our women. They're gonna do the, we gotta kill them all, right? The mm -hmm. other, it's addictive. It's, a, it's, a, it's physically a high, right? So I think that speculative fiction um, offers an alternative understanding of those processes you know, and our way of, of looking at the world and just our construction, because we're all kind of like, in a sense, addicts to this system of power, right? So when I read Sam Delaney and uh, Stars in My Pocket Like Grains of Sand, which is an amazing book, I read it in Brazil and I literally had to get a magazine picture, got a picture, you know, black woman, I put it as my bookmark because he flips the genders. And so when he says woman, he means people that have penises and people that have vaginas, but just people in power. If you're powerful, you're called a woman. And I was like, I got mad at myself. I'm like, I'm, I'm okay. Consider myself. Wow. Excuse me. I didn't think about that. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like saying like person, like, oh, this man walked down the street. You're reading the book. You think it's a white person unless otherwise indicated because we live in a white supremacist system where mm -hmm. whiteness is the tabula rasa, right? So for me, speculative fiction kind of breaks through all of that, you know, it, it forms, I went to the Afrofuturist exhibit in Oakland last weekend and uh, this past weekend, and it was amazing. But just looking at Du Bois as sociology as Afrofuturism, Henrietta Lacks' cells as Afrofuturism, mm -hmm. in addition to the music, in addition to the media, you know, and I say this you know, in the video that we did about Lovecraft Country, when you look at the history of the African diaspora, it's sci-fi. 
mm-hmm. right? Like if that was a story, you've been stolen, your tongue's been cut out, they cut your hands off, you play the drums, they cut your eyelids and make you work to death, right? They're gonna <laughs> rake you systemically, men and women. We only know about the women because they have the babies and then those babies are sold off one after the other, blah, blah, blah. Then we're told that the product of that sexual assault is more beautiful, they're smarter, they're more civilized, they're calmer, they're deserving of more money, they're deserving of land, right? Mm-hmm. And it's still happening, right? That's sci-fi, mm-hmm. that's sci-fi to me. You know, like if you pitch that, people are like, well, that's kind of arch. What do you mean <laughs> they did all that shit? What? They did in the slate, the shit, and they did, what are you talking about? You know, mm-hmm. that's why to me, the, the idea of uh, comics and, and sort of the, 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 uh, the white fangirl and white fanboy, you know, every so often they get enraged by something. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be a woman doing that. It shouldn't be a person with a majority doing that. When it's like comic codes were a part of the white supremacist system. So they didn't have heroes of the global majority because it wasn't legal, right? You couldn't have interracial people kissing, right? The astronaut, when the dude took his mask off and he was black, right? Back in the 50s, about to riot because we can't have that, right? Why is Star Wars so white? There's so many, there's so many, there's so much to talk about, but you don't have time to talk about that. But, but my only point is that in reading people like Sam and reading people like Joel Gomez, reading people like Octavia, you know, it, it gives me the space to find myself in these narratives. You know, I liken it to going to Brazil. You know, when I've been there, it's like I've enjoyed it because I kind of felt invisible, you know, because it's a global majority country. And so if someone is rude to me, I'm cool with it. I was there, well, it's been two years now, but when I was there in 2020, you know, I was in a coffee shop and God was just a jerk, you know? And I called my mom, I was like, mom, no, no, She's like, oh, no, no. But it was a relief because I'm like, well, he just don't like my face. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not like, oh, he's racist. I hate black people. Now, I'm not saying people of color can't hate themselves. All I'm saying is that in a country where you're the global majority, that, that feeling of like being jostled in traffic right like people just get into their job because they don't give a you know what about you is kind of a relief because mm-hmm. i don't have to think about okay i'm walking behind this chick with her groceries this could go so many different ways mm-hmm. she could call the cops on me right then i'm i'm a hashtag hollywood producer in front of his airbnb he's buying a house and, and no one cares right no one's burning anything up it's it's a it's a vibe <laughs> do you know what i mean and so in terms of that vibe i think again speculative fiction is kind of an antidote because it's also an alternative to um, to uh, creation narratives. You know, like if you think about like the Quran, bless the Quran. Think about the Bible, bless the Bible. You know, I'm not trying to knock any text out of anybody's hands, um, but the way that the work that those texts have been used by certain groups of people um, to either demonize or you know lift up is a very fascinating process, you know? Mm-hmm. And so to me, again, speculative fiction, you know, when you read and it's like the only, you know, thing that's ever present, I'm paraphrasing, is change, mm-hmm. right? God is change. And you're like, that makes sense to me, you know? And that's a, that's a different avenue to a thing versus being like, okay, I have to unpack this because, you know, growing up, I didn't go to Slaves Obey Your Master's Church. You know, I grew up going to uh, skin a bronze hair of wool, flip the table over church, right? Which I was cool. I'm blessed to have gone to that, to have that experience, right? In terms of being a black person. Um, but just having to unpack that mm-hmm. is wild, you know, if that's your creation narrative. You know, so for me, speculative fiction is a way of understanding, are we all aliens? Are we all stardust? Are we chosen? You know, and even if we're not, isn't it great to just fantasize about that? Because I don't have to think about this crap that's on TV right now. Because they're so hyped up on the drug of white supremacy, they can't help themselves. You know, it has to be this thing. Sinner, like, pay attention to me. You know what I mean? I'm gonna run my engine next to you so you look over because I'm a, you know, I'm a cop and you're just driving calmly. Why, bro? Just drive and, and do your job. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Go catch the bank robber. Hopefully, it's not Ryan Coogler. You know what I mean? Oops, hope it's not too soon for Atlanta. Mm-hmm. But do you know what I mean? They're like, <laughs> case in point, it's a drug. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's wild. Like, you're looking at his bank account, you're literally looking at his ID, his driver's license. He has a mask because of COVID, right? I'm sure, like, oh, he's wearing a mask. No, he's wearing a mask because of COVID. Mm-hmm. You have his driver's license. 
that is, you're looking at the number, like, that's wild. But again, speculative fiction, Wakanda Forever, for example, is freedom from those things, you know? And I think that's also, um, if you believe in conspiracy theories, systemically, like the Homestead Act and, you know, the, um, what's the thing when the veterans came back from the war uh, and all got money, except the black ones. No, she was, yeah. Yes. Um, you know, if you prevent black bodies from being in comics and in speculative fiction, then there is no escape. You know what I mean? So it does a very specific work. You know, it, like people are mad about Wakanda. You go online now, they're still ticked about Wakanda. Black Panther sucked. It's a billion, they probably made a trillion dollars at this point, right? Why is it suck? I don't see myself in it. And it was all about, they're not talking about kill white people. A kill monger was like, I might, you know, paper cut a couple of mugs real quick. But you know what I mean? But it was a Disney movie. It's not like, you mm -hmm. know, we're doing the thing. But people are mad because we're supposed to be like this. Oh, what was me? I was in a slave ship and I got beat down and we was assaulted. We're not supposed to thrive, right? We're not supposed to survive. And survival and the thriving and sticking your chest out and being proud and Wakanda forever, some kids doing that, that's forever. Right? This whole generation of people, whether you disagree with him being a warmonger or not, right? Drone president, you know, bless Barack, right? This whole generation of kids who are like, wow, you know, and we talked about that in my class because at that point, there had not been a black president. I remember. And I was like, I don't think he will be mucker. But if he is, what if he's the oppressor? <laughs> so, yeah. speaking of your class, right? Yeah. How has black studies prepared you for this? And by this, I mean your current moment. I would say that Black studies prepared me for life. Mm -hmm. And I say that um, with my full chest because uh, my mom bought me flashcards as a kid. So I knew about Matthew Henson and Garrett Morgan and Jack Matzik and all the, you know, all the people, right? Mm -hmm. So excited to come to school and tell people about that. But what it did for me, and this is retrospect, this is not me at the time knowing this. At the time it was just like, I just, you know, I'm Black and I love, you know, Jesus is Black, painting Black of Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, it's just my world, right? Thank my parents for that. Um, to me, Black Studies is uh, an organic uh, epistemology that provides you with a basis for critical thinking, mm. right? Because you're always looking at multiple, multiple facets, right? Whereas most people, like, I thank God I'm gay, right? Used to be time to be like, oh my gosh, I wish I wasn't gay. Oh, so hard. Oh, I'm oppressed. Am I going to hell? Like, all these existential questions, right? But what it did for me, if I were heterosexual, we wouldn't be on the Zoom because mm -hmm. I would have probably gone on to be a probably evangel evangelist because I was more of an evangelical. I'm kind of like, I'm fiery. You know, I just take off right away. Preacher has to take your time. Right? I'm just like, ah, gee. Yeah, like, ah, right? Yeah, yeah, the whole thing. Um, I would be somewhere in the Midwest, maybe Chicago, right? With wife, kids, about to retire maybe doing some tent revivals because I used to be a fan of tent revivals with the fold out chairs and tambourines and foot stomping. Like I'm, I love that stuff. You know what I mean? I'm a spirit space. So, but because I was in a world where I was like, Oh snap. Oh snap. There's also this whole thing about white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? Where like people are like, Oh, you shouldn't go to college because you should be a vocational student. And I'm like, I'm taking AP chemistry. What are you talking about? I should be a vocational student. <laughs> mom, mom. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? My mom's coming to like just Judy, like, what's up? My son is an AP kid. What do you, you know what I mean? Like, so to me, Black Studies is just an extension of thought where, you know, even at Yale, uh, you know, uh, some of the professors were like, we're all white, but we're very different people, right? I had another professor uh, call a, a visiting student from Brown my name because he happened to be Black, right? And we look nothing alike. Um, they said we had different standards, right? And when we got to different standards, that was fellow grad students. And when mm -hmm. I heard the rumors, you know, well, they say I'm different standards. Sure. Then someone finally got bold enough to say it to me, you know, at a party. And, uh, you know, I was a little firecracker, you know, more so than I am now. I'm kind of a mature, just, you know, I'm an unexploded ordinance now, right? <laughs> but back then, back then, I was like, what's up? You know what I mean? So it was like, oh, you have different standards. And I was like, you mean different standards and that I have to know all of like black literature and like, you know, predominant literature, because my orals are Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Victorian poetry, uh, Hughes, Hurston, Parker, Lord. Yeah, we, we can keep going. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, you got to know the majority to get to the quote unquote offshoot, right? You know, 
I, I, there's no way you can, you know, I got no women to be able to talk about uh, Baldwin, right? In a, and to me, in an intellectually mature conversation, it's important that the U.S. Uh, education system under educates people, miseducates people on purpose to control us and have us fighting each other. But Black studies for me is, is again, the center of any sort of real conversation, because how do you talk about freedom and not talk about the enslaved? You're talking about, oh, the Constitution. Their understanding of what freedom was is based on whiteness as property. I'm not First Nation, so I can own land that we're stealing. And I'm not Black, therefore I'm not property. I can't be sold. So mm -hmm. people that look like this cut, right, on those images in New Orleans, right? Little girl with show the temple curls, right? She's a negress, she's an octoroon, whatever phrasing they're using. That's systemic. But how do you get to that if you're just cheering on Americana and its manifest destiny and the heathens died and the savage, you know, the savage Indians were murdered? Like to me, it's a very ignorant way of life. But again, ignorance is bliss, and people rather live in bliss rather than, you know, like you if you're a black studies major, you're gonna have an awakening with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Mm -hmm. You were woke based yeah. on Michael Stewart, who is Basquiat's best friend, who was lynched by the, L the NYPD when he jumped over a turnstile in freaking 1980, like 486. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That was Eric Garner then. We're not even talking about Diallo and Dorisman and Louima, right? Before we get to Freddie Gray and Trayvon Martin, right? And then we jump back to Emmett Till. And then all the people in the 70s, you know, whose names I don't commit to memory because there's so many. But again, Watts came out of the Watts Rebellion, came out of the context of police brutality. Right. Sometimes get beat by the cops and they was like, they keep killing us. They keep getting away with it. Uh, we're not considered human. Right. They got this new war on drugs. We're only targeting us and the hippies to again, but this, you know, incarcerate us or kill us. We're about to burn some stuff up. Mm -hmm. But again, to me, if you're a black studies major, you understand that even the idea of a riot is only become black in modern day. Riot mm -hmm. is Tulsa. Riot is the red summer. You know, we're literally again. Long, long plan, you know, we don't have to go into all that, but <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like Supreme Court society and religious freedom. It's against gay people, against trans people. That can easily be applied because the KKK burns crosses. That can be applied to segregation. My God said that the Tower of Babel fell, therefore black and white should not mix. This is a white only restaurant. People can say, yes, we get rid of abortion. All right, we're going to start having numbers again. And we're looking at, okay, we're just going to burn some stuff up because we feel like it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where we are. You know what I mean? Like the same conversations. Critical race theory is the same thing as political correctness. Same mm -hmm. thing as desegregation. You know, it's so again, black studies to me is again is, a, is an antidote that you can take that allows you, you'll be mad because it's gonna piss you off, you know. But it for me, it makes you a mature thinker and it doesn't allow you to necessarily fall for the hope you dope. You know, so if you're mad, you'll be mad for a reason, not just because they're spinning you in a circle. So last question before we take it to the Q and A. Um, what are you working on now? What do you want? Where do you want to see yourself going? Um, I just want to be healthy, make it through traffic, <laughs> uh, get ripe and old and mature. You know what I mean? And if people think I'm bitter, but I'm just a cynic, right? Um, in terms of work, right now we're working on a project called Say Their Names, which is looking at the murders committed by the Grim Sleeper and other serial killers. Grim Sleeper was like a 30 year span. And he lasted 30 years because uh, he killed women, he killed black women, girls and women. And um, most of them were poor. Uh, many of them were uh, ensconced in addiction, me, specifically crack addiction. And some were sex workers. Excuse me, some of them were sex workers to pay for their addictions. So they, you know, there's, there's different classifications of sex workers, and the sex workers are paying for drugs, you know, all that stuff. Um, but we're looking at it from the perspective of Margaret Prescott, who is a Bayesian activist who uh, started the, the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders and pressured the you know, LAPD um, to take it seriously, local politicians, and also Black institutions, like the Black Church didn't care as a, as a whole, and the NAACP, National Urban League did not care because these women weren't considered respectable. You know, and they're all labeled that. You know, like he killed, you know, like his woman going to a Tupperware party with mm -hmm. her friends. You need a ride? No, I'm good. I oh, just see black women, you don't know how to take a compliment. He said that to one of the survivors. That's what I'm saying. But in this version, when we get in the car, he murders her. 
you know, um, in a horrific fashion. And so working on that, that's why I was crying because he's a serial rapist, serial kidnapper, serial murderer of scores of women and girls. And he only got tried and convicted for 10. There's like a uh, hundred or so pictures they have of women that we don't know. And then there's those that we don't know because he worked for the sanitation department, he worked for the LAPD. And so uh, he was able to uh, function as a cleaner cleaning the streets um, of social ills. You know, it's also mm -hmm. the era of AIDS, you know, so sex workers were considered as, you know, lethal weapons walking around and crack was, you know, middle of crack, you know, and it's fascinating uh, looking at it because now, you know, I went to a, a comedy show December and I walked out because this woman got up, she's like, yeah, my cat's on crack. And I looked around. Like, I was literally like, like Morgan Freeman and Shawshank Redemption when he found the money. He looked around like, some, I literally looked around like, where, where, where am I, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, why in 2021 are you telling a crackhead joke about your cat, right? And I got him walked out because I'm like, I paid, I don't care. But I'm like, if you said, oh, this is a meth joke, this is an oxy joke, he was like, oh, you can't do that. I mean, you know, they're not, they just had problems, mm -hmm. right? Even the understanding of addiction is criminalized when it comes to our bodies. We still have people doing 50 to life for weed, for weed. And I got this, y'all in Georgia, y'all ain't got this, but I got, these are edibles. <laughs> this is, this is THC, right? This is legal. This is recreational in LA, right? Mm -hmm. That's a company. I don't know who owns that company, right? It's black owned, it might be. More than likely, it's white owned. We have a whole infrastructure of industry people getting rich off of something that our bodies have or continue to be criminalized about mm -hmm. you know and so all those different topics massage and war etc cetera, etc cetera, um and all the different facets from medical to you know political to you know social we're going to be dealing with in that limited series and um you should also read uh Margaret's book, I'm sorry, Margaret's daughter, Chanda, C-H-A-N-D-A. She has a, an amazing book, which I would grab, but it's over there across the room. But if you look it up, she's a, a scientist. I think she does like physics, but it's like, she's kind of an Afrofuturist. She's really bright. She's an activist and amazing, but it's an interesting sort of amalgamation of all the different parts. You know, it's like Pat Parker said, waiting for the revolution that allows me to bring all my parts, right? I think that uh, Chanda is doing that. It's a living testament to that. So that's one project. And then we're doing um, Octavia Butler's Fledgling, which is her final novel, which is about uh, vampires and uh, this alien race of vampires that are white presenting and they're trying to be day walkers. So they do experiments on each other. And then one of them who's 50, she gets experiments done on her and she wakes up as a 10 year old black girl. And so the book is kind of. It's supposed to be a trilogy, which she didn't get to finish, but we'll have access to her papers, which is amazing. Um, but, uh, you know, it's really about being caught between different worlds. You know, so you have the, the aliens who are like, no, and then you have the human world is like, you know, is she a weapon? All the different you know, things. It's kind of a metaphor for all the different uh, belonging stories. You know, whether that's through immigration status, whether that's through gender identity, whether that's, you know, through um, class. But for me, it's exciting because um, it happened kind of on accident because I wrote part of my just last chapter of my dissertation was on the Gilda stories. And so that was always had been a goal. I'm like, we're going to do Gilda. <laughs> it's going to crack <laughs> off, right? And we're on Lovecraft Country. And uh, we talked, I tried, I, I had emo jewel in like 2005. I was like, this is a good movie. Shit, someone else had the rights. So in 2018, we were like, I was like, April. We had just finished like episode eight, like Emmett Till episode. And I was like, I think we got enough juice to go get Gilda now, because this we about to do this thing real quick. Love cry. Ah, right. So we we got into it and it was close. And then you know, ended up going with one of her friends that she knew. And I was devastated because I was like, I dreamed about. Gilda coming to life on TV since 2003 um, when I wasn't even a TV writer. And uh, but what happened was we went to a meeting, so my universe will reveal 
I sat down with the guy and uh, he was like, so how's your day? And Sonia was like, oh, it's doing great, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, my, my day is pretty crappy. I said the other word. I said, we're chasing this, you know, this project and, you know, we lost it. And it was da, 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 da. so amazing. And he was like, oh, that's really interesting because I'm chasing fledgling right now. And it was like, da, 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 da. Um, and so Sonia, you know, got on that while I went to Atlanta for Lovecraft and everything, you know, sort of happened after that, you know. And then beyond that, um, you know, we got other stuff cooking, do you know what I mean, which I can't talk about yet because it's not solidified in a way that is worthy of talking about. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we're hoping in the future to have a lot of different content, you know, expanding our brand and the specul- speculative fiction, going into comedy, um, and just stories that are conversation starters and, you know, either pull your heartstrings or make your stomach drop because you're kind of afraid and maybe a little bit of both. Cool. So, um, we got some questions that I'm going to read aloud from the Q&A. Hey. Uh, first is from Dr. Bennett Bailey. She says, amazing talk. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, her question is, do you think there is a shift in television now with Black sci-fi and all Black shows that point to systemic racism, i.e. Watchmen, Lovecraft, Get Out, and the like? Um, I think that, I think the shift, is, I think there's a shift, but I also feel like it's in the context of history, you know? Mm-hmm. So if you look at Oscar Micheaux's Within Our Gates, that's playbook. I'm looking at Birth of a Nation and I'm flipping it upside down, right? So you got the evil black rapist and then Within Our Gates, it's like, oh, the woman's about to be attacked by the white man. He sees the birthmark and it's his daughter. Oh my gosh, what? right? Mm-hmm. So I feel like black artists, uh, I disagree with Langston Hughes because like, are you an artist or black artist? I'm like, we're black artists that you can have a conversation over dinner, yeah, a coffee, you know, you know, at salons to me, other people may disagree. They have the right to, they can do Anne Rand's version and just be an artist. That's great. But to me, I feel like, uh, Ossie Davis and Ruby D, you know, Bobby Kaufman, the father of the beats who never gets talked about, right? Like all these artists have spoken to, you know, the hegemonic structure of white supremacy. I think to me, the only difference now is that there's money that, can be finally recognized. It's not as if we weren't making money before, but I think technology has led to that, you know, in its own version of Afrofuturism. Because 500 channels, you know, I always liken it to, one, I would give credit to Grey's Anatomy, more so to the game and Scandal, right? Mm-hmm. Scandal, you had the first black woman lead of a drama in Kerry Washington, right? Since Dan Carroll. Um, that size, like, oh, you know, not gonna, I roll my eyes. <laughs> it's Ooh. annoying, it's annoying, right? It's annoying. <laughs> um, you have that, but the game got canceled, right? And there's an article that just came out that talked about UPN building its brand off of black content and then canceling all those shows, right? The article came out like two weeks ago. They tried that with the game. Game's been canceled, bye-bye. And then BET was like, huh, we're gonna bring the game back, right? <laughs> and it's burned in my brain because I was on a show called Killer Women, so it was 2013. We premiered the same night and the game kicked our butt. <laughs> eight million viewers because black folks were good for a good eight million views. Right. And the other thing too, I think there in terms of a cultural shift, I think that um how do I say this? I think that the reins of white supremacy have shifted in a way. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the success of Empire, you know, uh, that's because there's a whole generation of people 55 and down who listen to hip hop, right? Now it gets problematic to me because I don't think, you know, the N-word should be a lingua franca for hip hop, you know, sue me. But, you know, don't get mad if people drop an N-word and they're not black if this, that's all you're rapping about. That's just me, right? I'm like, why are we objects? Why aren't we human beings? Why, why is there this, this, that's a whole other conversation. But my point is that, you know, I do see a shift there, but I do think that, you know, people who were, um, if you have to squint at them and be like, does he mean E-R or A? To me, that's the problematic aspects of the stretch of Black culture. But I do think that, you know, because of the game, um, you know, Black Panther managed to get through, Luke Cage got through. I do think that that has opened up spaces for more voices, you know? I think Lovecraft has opened up space. I think Watchmen has opened up space. I think Get Out, you know, definitely, um, 
surprise a lot of people, you know, but again, that's on the financial side, like, mm -hmm. oh, we can make money. You know, that's why I was saying I would have been in Nigeria because there's a lot of money to be made in Nigeria. <laughs> you know I mean? There's a lot of money to be made in African mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So Dr. Jonathan Gales asks you, well, first he says, thank you for this brilliant presentation. And he wants to know what you are reading or watching now that inspires and or sustains you. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I would say that I, uh, I'm reading, I'm supposed to start reading another Delaney book, mm -hmm. um, but I haven't started that yet. But I'm reading this book, it's like next to me, The Listener's Guide to Free Improvisation, it's a jazz mm -hmm. book. But mm -hmm. it's just, to me, I read it like philosophy and think about people um, as these sort of notes and musical notes, and we're all kind of improvising our way through life. And then how do you, you know, it's his own sort of antidote in a way. Um, in terms of fiction, I would say I'm rereading Beloved. Mm -hmm. And I'm rereading Beloved because, you know, uh, Dr. Morrison is an amazing writer. And every time I read her, it's something different. You know, and she could be considered an Afrofuturist in a lot of ways. You read Song of Solomon, you're like, oh, this is Afrofuturist. Mm -hmm. And so I would say um, that's what's in front of me right now, like what I read this morning was beloved. Oh, oh in terms of TV shows, I forgot to say that one. Okay. Um, I have a whole different plethora of Made I watched, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, Netflix show it talks a lot about class. It's a, you know, economic underdeveloped young white woman, single mother, and going through an abusive context with her baby's father um depressing but emotionally heart-wrenching and then i'm also watching love is blind brazil <laughs> <laughs> because i like the american version of season two i didn't like season one because they made the women look very thirsty and desperate and like my eggs are dry i don't like that kind of crap but season two a little bit better right but brazil the women for the most part are like i got two different men chasing me who am i gonna pick and i personally enjoy that so mm -hmm. it's it's fun to watch it's a nice escape <laughs> the next question um is from scholar nicholas ortiz and they say i appreciate this talk um dr kid wondering i like the framing of quote people of the global majority what does that language do for you uh what it does for me is it's a conversation starter mm -hmm. you know so the idea um it, it it prompts a reaction you know i think that when you say minority in what context right george w bush didn't know that there were black people in brazil that's embarrassing and he went to, he went to yale that's very embarrassing right um <laughs> like what but so for me people the global majority is is a very specific uh it's like the bit about black versus african-american some people say i like african-american because african reminds you where i'm from other people say i'm not a hyphen you know if you talk to margaret prescott she's like well we went from black to african-american so we forgot about the diaspora you know you're trying to separate us we're all black so mm -hmm. to me people of the global majority is just another evolving tool that is used that can kind of remind people because there's this anesthesia that keeps coming over people like, oh, people get killed by the cops. I have to watch a snuff film of a man being smothered to death for seven minutes to understand that there's inequality and that schools suck and that people going to jail. You know, it's, it's wild, <laughs> you know what I mean? So that phrasing to me allows me to have pride, right? Um, and being a part of the global majority, right? And also sense of responsibility, mm. you know? And also, again, it, it's, uh, I used to say, you know, I said to you when you were my student, you know, if you're a part of the global majority, act like it, you know, if you're, if you don't have a penis, act like it, right? Because the guy's doing this and say, hey, hey, I'm over talking to you. And uh, uh, this is, this is wine. Like, no, it's not. That's um, chlorophyll and some sea moss. And no, 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 it's red wine. No, it's chlorophyll. You know, that privilege that comes with that, the hubris that comes with that to me, mm -hmm is uh, a form of energy that can be um, quite useful when used in the proper context. Mm, excellent. Now, the last question right now in the Q&A um, is from Dr. Joyce King. Have you read anything written by Aikwe Arma, 2000 Seasons, Osiris Rising? If so, do you have any thoughts? No, I have not. 
So that should be on the list. So you should email that to me so I can read it. I will, I will do so. I will do so directly after this. So I think in the interest of time, we're going to close it out. Um, I have one last final thing, but I wanted to make sure you have a word if there's anything else you'd like to share with us. Um, I would say that uh, if I say parting words, just keep working, keep fighting. You know, I think that this can be a depressing time and, uh, you know, with the pandemic or whether or not it was, you know, if it's natural or it's a biological weapon, like some people suspect, you know, HIV and AIDS were, and it kind of doesn't matter. This mm -hmm. is like how you comport yourself in the face of uh, insurmountable odds, you know, and the thing that I take joy in um, and the phrase like people go majority is this instinct, you know, and the fact that, uh, you know, truth curse to the earth will always rise, you know. And so to me, I think that would be the takeaway in terms of, you know, I, I, when I talk, I always talk about systemic oppression, you know, but I have a way of uh, processing it, you know, through my understanding of the world and my cynicism and my, you know, my faith and my meditation and all that stuff that allows me to not carry it all the time. And so my humble hope and sincere prayer would be that those that are uh, under the sound of my voice would work toward, right, having that process for themselves where they're moving through the world as free people, you mm -hmm. know, because that's what we are. We're free as, as our minds want us to be, you know, and that's, that's the blessing that as you know, speculative fiction has given us. So, so thank you to everybody who has helped to put this together and especially everybody who has attended this evening. Our next uh, Freedom School talk is in two weeks. Thank you, spring break. We have two weeks, March 23rd, and it will be Dr. Sarita Davis. Uh, the title of the talk is Decolonizing the Black Female Body, Getting to Self-Determination. It will be moderated by Dr. Akinyele Moja. And this one will not be live. It will be pre-recorded, but there will be some questions at the end for some interaction. So I just wanted to end with um, a sincere thank you to Dr. Jonathan Kidd. Much love. Thank you.